note, we have um, the lead cabinet member for environmental services and licensing, Councillor Brian William Brian Milnes, uh, also online. Good to see you. Sorry to get your name wrong. Okay, so can we go live then, please, Aaron? We are live. We are live. Good. Good afternoon, and welcome to this meeting of the licensing committee. My name is Councillor Anna Bradnam, and I'm the chair of the licensing committee. A few points of housekeeping for everyone. Whether you're present in the chamber or virtually, please make sure that you do not switch your microphone on unless you're invited to speak. Those who are participating virtually should, if possible, use a headset microphone. Please, would those who are attending virtually indicate a wish to speak by use of chat in the Teams meeting, uh, which DEM services will monitor. Those present in the council chamber would indicate their wish to speak by raising your hands, please. I'll ask Aaron to keep a note of speakers virtually. Please always wear a face covering when in the building. I notice I'm not, but I will if people would prefer I did, but I think you might not be able to hear me so well. Um, so please keep a face covering on when you're in the building and in the chamber, except when sitting at your table to minimize the risk to both you and others. Please make use of the hand sanitizer on the table in front of you and at the sanitizing stations on the way in. This meeting is being webcast live and a recording will be available after the meeting. By being present or contributing to the meeting, participants agree to their images and voices being broadcast and used for training purposes. Attendees may also make their own audio and video recordings so long as they do not interfere with the meeting. So please, members, remember to turn off your mobile phones and other alarms or set them to silent. And if any member needs to leave during the meeting, please could you make this known so that it can be recorded. We also uh, have um, the Principal Licensing Officer, Rachel Jackson, and also Licensing Officer, Brooke O'Neill, with us. And we have Paul Weller uh, to advise us in a legal capacity if we need that. So, first of all, apologies for absence. Um, I have um, apologies from Councillor Alex Mallion and Councillor Claire Delderfield. Do you have any others? Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, I've also got apologies from uh, Councillor Joe Hales and Councillor Nigel Clayton. Thank you. Sorry, Gavin Clayton. <laughs> apologies, Chair. Okay. Thank you very much. So, declarations of interest. Um, do any committee members have any interests that they would like to declare in relation to items on the agenda? I can't see any hands raised. And I can't see any online. Is there anything on chat? Okay, thank you. So, first item, first substantive item then, minutes of the previous meeting, which was held on Tuesday the 7th of September at 2 p.m., uh, members may remember that it was a, a restrained meeting because many of the items we actually deferred to this meeting. So, does anybody have any matters of accuracy with those minutes? Councillor Handley? Uh, just to say that I actually am not listed as present when I was actually there. Well, you're going to need to move your microphone a bit closer, <laughs> Councillor Handley. I can't hear um, I'm not listed as being present, and I was present. Okay, we'll add you to the, because I remember you being there. Any other additions? Okay. Okay, so with that, are you happy that I sign those as a true record of the meeting then, members? If you could show by hands. Okay, lovely. Thank you very much. Um, next item then is the... Hackney Carriage and Private Hire Policy Second Review. So, following the meeting in September, we agreed that a workshop would be arranged to enable members to discuss the proposed amendments. And that workshop took place in October, and the agreed recommendations can be found at page on nine onwards. And I will point out to you the format of that page the existing policy runs down the left-hand side of the page 
and the decisions of that workshop, which would in theory be for ratification at this meeting, are on the right-hand side, unless we have further discussion. Um, so, one aspect that members will, however, be asked to consider is the request to allow diesel hybrid plug-ins to be licensed. And this is to allow the trade some flexibility whilst ensuring the emissions meet the standards set in the policy. And today we have Mr. Paul Clare and Mr. Andrew Cundell from Panther Taxis who've requested this amendment to the policy and to explain the rationale. Um, so firstly, I'd like to ask uh, the lead officer, Rachel Jackson, to introduce the report. And then I'll ask the gentleman from Panther Taxis to address the committee, if that's okay with you, gentlemen. Great. You look very far away down at the end there. So, Ms. Jackson, would you like to present your report, please? Thank you, Chair. Following the licensing committee on the 7th of September 2021, the committee agreed to some amendments in the policy. As you have mentioned already, these changes were the fixing of plates, CCTV, right to work evidence, and tax conditionality requirements. These implementations have been reflected in our current policy. However, as the, as the chair has already mentioned, the committee wished to defer some aspects to enable a workshop for members to consider matters further. The outcome of the workshop and agreed in principle amendments to those deferred items are attached, as the chair has said, as Appendix A to the report. It is requested that members approve the amendments today. A further request of the workshop, again, as the chair has just referred to, regarding uh, Panther Tank Taxi's uh, request to permit plug-in hybrid diesel engine vehicles as of the 1st of December. Because as you'll note from the agenda papers, the proposal is as of the 1st of December, there will be no, no newly licensed diesel engines. So again, this is to allow some flexibility. As you say, uh, our representatives have kindly arrived from Panther Taxis and are available here to address the committee and hopefully address any concerns you may have. And if there are no questions, that does conclude my introduction. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Jackson. Okay, so I just want to refer us briefly, if I may, to page 67. This is where the summary of the environmental conditions the table exists um, and that refers to the policy, the rationale and the implementation date. So previously we had um, set a date for all hackney carriage and private hire vehicles licensed for the first time by this authority to be zero or ultra low emission with effect from the 1st of December 2021 and this is one of the aspects that we're seeking to change. Okay, so um, Mr. Paul Clare, would you like to uh, come forward and explain why you've requested that should be delayed? And also, can I just say thank you so much for your very thorough um, response to every single point on, on, the, on the consultation, which I very much appreciate, and for your narrative email afterwards. That was so helpful. So thank you very much. No problem. Thank you very much. And thanks for having us here today. Um, I'd just like to reassure everybody before we start, we're fully behind what the green agenda that you guys have got to accede to going forward. Um, anything I say is not intended to, to push that back. And further, we're very pleased that you've given and are continuing to give consideration to the trade as it recovers from, from COVID, which has been very problematic, continues to be so. Um, we were not unhappy with your previous decision or idea to ban the buying of diesels until 2023, but noted with our arguably slightly more intimate knowledge of, of of vehicles that are available to the trade, that to implement that would mean you're in fact denying the trade the chance to purchase from a small band of vehicles, um, the models of which, well, examples of the models of which I've supplied previously, mm -hmm. that are plug-in diesel hybrids and are in fact 
the sort of vehicles that you wanted the trade to be buying, that we all wanted the trade to be buying, as of December the 1st upcoming. Um, so by banning the purchase of diesels across the board, we felt you're inadvertently, maybe, um, well, definitely, but maybe it hadn't been in your thought process, um, denying the drivers the chance to buy the small band of diesel hybrids. Now, as it happens, most of the plug-in diesel hybrids, hybrids are, and I think I've supplied this as well, come back up under 50 milligrams per kilometre in their emissions. Which, as we sit here today, the Vehicle Certificate Certification Agency have, they currently categorise, and again, this is in your policy, they, they currently categorise a ultra-low emissions vehicle as under 75, and that was due to be changed, likely to be changed this year. Um, that hasn't happened. I've checked with the Vehicle Certification Agency. That hasn't dropped, as they expected, to under 50. However, virtually all of the plug-in hybrid diesel vehicles that you're inadvertently potentially denying the trade buy-in do fall below the 50 anyway. We then had, so, so that was, the, that was the, the, the thread of my, of my latest correspondence and I'm happy to try and answer any questions about that if you wish. You, we then had some further thoughts and I'll just indulge you, you may tell me to, you may take no notice, but we'll just, we had some further thoughts since I, since I wrote in. Those being that, would it maybe a better tactic stance to allow the drivers to buy hybrid vehicles for these two years that we're now talking about so that anything below 99 emission grams per kilometer would be allowed and you would then and, and, and drop the diesel idea the banning of diesel idea and but you would then be giving the drivers quite a few more options while still being able to look the public in the eye and say you're, you're well on the way to move into, to, you know, on, on your green agenda. All these cars would then be hybrid vehicles. You'd probably, only if, uh, a thought, a thought, I, I can't tell you what to do, but a thought would be um, to move, if you did that, to move your four-year age rule out to six years for a couple of years. And the logic behind that would be that would really open up the market for drivers to buy hybrid vehicles. So everything that's categorized as low emissions under 99 grams per kilometer. And, um, and, in, and in doing so, you would get them buying the cars at the sort of age that when the policy in, in all likelihood does come in in two years time, they'll be ready to change their vehicles. What I'm, what I'm telling you is, knowing the behaviour of the drivers as we do, if you moved your age limit out to six years, allowed them to buy under 100 gram hybrids, you would get an, ultimately, you would get a quicker changeover in the medium term to the fully electric or the ultra low emissions, rather than leaving it at four in which case the driver habit will be to change just before the rule comes in and then sit on that car for quite some time before changing to electric or, or ULEV. So those were our thoughts. Our first thought was, if you do implement the diesel thing, please don't um, uh, uh, prevent the drivers from buying the diesel plug-in hybrids, as that's probably against the edicts of your own policy um, and quest. And secondly, would it be better, would it be worth a chat thinking about um, implementing it as a hybrid only policy and dropping the um, no diesel element of the rules? That's where I am. I'm, 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 when, when you guys um, went for the diesel thing, the no diesel thing, one of the things you may or may not have realized is that many diesels these days, and particularly the ones in the age range that the, that the drivers are buying at the moment, the sort of 
16, 17, 18 plates and newer. Many of them have got SCR technology in them, which is selective catalytic reduction technology, which don't ask me how it works, I don't know. But to me and you on the street, it's the, the, the add blue thing that you put in to your vehicle that runs alongside your, your fuel system. Andrew will tell you more about how it works than me. What it does do is it brings the emissions ratings of many of the diesels right down. And the actual argument between petrol and diesel, which is the, which is the dirtier, is, is a very tight argument, swings either way in a lot of people's minds, as given that technology. So, again, just banning diesels was always arguably a bit marginal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Clare. Um, I hope I'm not the only person on this committee who recognises your greater understanding of A, the technology, but also the buying pattern of the drivers concerned. Um, and so can I just clarify, I will come to you, Councillor Hunt. You've asked us, in, and that's in the papers, um, don't prevent drivers from buying diesel hybrids. So in other words, delay the um, all requirement to be um, all electric or ULEV from December 2021 to December 2023. That's still on the table. You're highlighting, because of the buying pattern of drivers, you're suggesting we separate out the diesels from the hybrids. Uh, but we haven't got that as a request on the papers, which is slightly tricky, isn't it? Um, but, and you're also suggesting we could consider moving the age limit to six years for a couple of years to allow this buying pattern to happen and but keep and also change the maximum emissions to less than 100 grams uh, milligrams per kilometer have I have I understood you correctly yeah pretty much if you're if you're keeping the, the diesel the no diesel thing on the table please don't ban the hybrids within that is, is one stance, and then there's the alternative stance of six-year age rule um, and allow the drivers to get, drop, drop the diesel and petrol argument and just allow the drivers to get a hybrid that comes in at under 99, uh, under 100 grams yeah. per kilometre, which is what the, the great and the good accept as low emissions. That's, that's what's categorised by the Vehicle Certification Agency as, as low emissions currently. Um, and by doing the six-year thing, we believe it will aid the, the, the speed of the eventual move over to the cars we all really want to get, the, the electrics and the, and the, and the ULEBs. Assuming the infrastructure is in place, that's another argument altogether. That's another thing again. But yeah, you've, you've, yeah, you've understood that correctly, yeah. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Councillor Hunt. Thank you, Chair, but uh, I wonder if it might be better if we have the other public speaker first, as he may, in fact, address our question. Anybody? Um, we could. I, I don't think he wants to. I think no, I think he was supporting okay. Mr. Clare. They're, they're both from Panther, Panther okay. Taxis. Yeah, um, well, thank you. I'd like to thank the speaker and acknowledge that I do appreciate the practical difficulties that in acquiring super vehicles that our decision could make today. But I thought it's important that we make sure that members of the committee are au fait with the operating characteristics of plug-in hybrid vehicles. Now, when you see plug-in hybrid vehicles advertised, they do have very impressive numbers, 50 grams, milligrams, um, 120, 150 miles per gallon. But what you have to realize is that a plug-in hybrid vehicle has a relatively small rechargeable battery and a petrol or diesel engine. And the range on electricity is about, typically about 30 miles, maybe 35. Um, after that, you're running a petrol or diesel engine, and you're getting about 40 miles per gallon. So in order to meet those impressive-looking figures that are published, you basically have to be driving a relatively small number of miles in between recharges. 
and that might, might be 45 miles, 50 miles, something like that. And if you're exceeding that, and I'm afraid I have no idea what a typical uh, cab does in a day, but if you're exceeding that in between recharges, you are probably going to be doing worse emissions than an ordinary petrol or diesel car, and almost certainly worse than an ordinary hybrid car, a non-plug-in hybrid car. And that's because a plug-in hybrid has a very heavy battery, it has to move around, and that battery is empty for most of the day. So that is, that is why I'm a slightly uh, cautious about this proposal. Um, now, there are, you know, a couple of other points which I'd make, which is most plug-in, you might say, well, okay, you might be able to recharge it during your lunchtime. Well, maybe you could, but most plug-in hybrid vehicles do not have the rapid plug recharge facility. So they're kind of several hours to recharge. Um, and and another, another characteristic is that in the winter, when you're using the heating, that reduces the electric range because it's electrically powered. So you have to be very careful. Um, I know the figures, the official figures are that it does 50 or whatever it is um, emissions, but that's only if you drive it in a certain way. And they're really aimed at commuters who are going to charge it up overnight, drive 10 miles to work, work, drive home again, charge it up again. Um, if you're a professional driver flying the streets all day, I wonder whether it's actually a good idea. Um, I will say one positive in favor of them, which is that you do get to choose, at least on most models, where you run the engine. So you could, for example, choose to use the engine out of town and use the battery in town where you care more about particulars and so on. So it's, it's not, I'm sorry, it hasn't ended up really being a question. It's really more to uh, hopefully illuminate people here who may not be as familiar. I've driven one for many years, so I'm quite familiar with the pros and cons of plug-in hybrid vehicles. That's really helpful. Thank you, Councillor Hunt. And I, I trust, Mr. Clare, that sort of, um, does that chime with your understanding of how a taxi driver might use such a vehicle and whether it would be really appropriate for what they do in the normal day-to-day -day running of a taxi? Yeah, very much so. Um, everything Mr. Hunt has said, I, we, uh, yeah, is, is accurate. It's always been a slight mystery to us why plug-in hybrids have been categorised along with the, the electrics to, as, as the way forward. But, in, you know, we don't deal with just this council and um, it, they, they've, they've, they've always been lumped in, but they do, they do work, shall we say, in exactly the manner that Mr. Hunt's just described. So it's always been a bit of a mystery to us. Would taxi drivers stop consciously and charge them so that they can do a further 30, 40 miles um, economically, environmentally speaking, in the real world? No. Okay. Um, but it is, yes, always the council that have had plug-in hybrids in the, the sort of, you know, trying to cast blame on anybody, but yeah, with, along with the electrics. Thank you very much. Um, yes, we've got Councillor Harvey. Thank you. Ah, thank you, Chair. Well, just picking up on that then, um, I think Mr. Clare is, is sort of agreeing with Councillor Hunt that um, because of the limited range, we'll very quickly. Councillor Harvey, to, just wait a moment. Because of the limited range of a, a ULA, we'd be back to effectively diesel operation um, really quite quickly during um, a taxi driving day. <laughs> so as, as Mr. Clare's agreeing with that, is, is the suggestion that we don't exclude diesel ULEVs um, not really just a way of saying we'd like to carry on driving diesels and have business as usual for another two years, which seems to me to be a wrong a retrograde step. Is that you finished? Have you oh, well, that was a question for Mr. Clare, really, I suppose. Oh, okay. Um, I have so, got some other points I would like to make. Well, since this, uh, as far as I'm concerned, this is a, a learning experience for all of us because it's quite complicated. I have noticed you wanted to speak. Mr. Clare, would you like, I mean, would you like to, I think it's reasonable to ask you if, you have any thoughts on that? Um, uh, I, I, I think it, it might be beneficial if we bring Andrew in now okay. to respond yep, to, to, to that. So this is Forgive us, everybody and the public, we have works going on on the side of the building.
So if you would just pause when the drilling is going on. Uh, Councillor Harvey, would you turn in the microphone, please? Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Andrew Cundell, I believe you're, you are able to speak about engines? Yes, I hope so. I, I certainly completely agree with Councillor Hunt about the plug-in hybrids and have disagreed. What we're really suggesting is the council have always wanted a push to plug-in hybrids. I think he's right. It should be hybrids currently, period. Be it diesel or petrol. Be it diesel or petrol currently, it just needs to be a hybrid that's below 100 GMs or so, most of them are at 99. That would solve the problem for the, for the next couple of years for the drivers. It would increase your green fleet because they would be hybrids. And if the vehicles are slightly, our suggestion for the slightly older age group is it doesn't change the emissions on the vehicle because they're still all Euro 6 stuff. But what it would do... is that when your nine-year rule kicks in in a couple of years' time, these cars will then be, the drivers will then be forced to change them because of their age. Therefore, at that point, they're going to go either all electric. I think you should probably drop the plug-in hybrid because I don't really see the point of them at all, but it should either go all electric, or hopefully by then, there should be some hydrogen cars on the market. But there's also quite a few now self-charging hybrids out there that only do a very small amount of miles when they self-charge, but I suspect two or three years up the road, they will be doing 30 or 40 miles, 50 miles when they self-charge without having to be plugged in, but run on pure electric for that period, so it's better quality charging. There's already two or three out there doing that. Suzuki have got one out already. Um, so I think going ahead, that will get you greener, quicker, solve the driver at the problem at the moment while he's short of money because he hasn't really worked for the last period of time. It's getting busier. He'll get his money back together. He'll be able to afford the newer cars. Hopefully, you'll have better uh, charging points available to everybody. It'll be quicker and it's straightforward. So, I, um, we don't okay. mind from the okay. point of view, but we just think it'll be better. Right, so, thank you very much. That's helpful. Councillor Roberts. Thank you very much, Chairman. And I think we've got to all, all remember the reality that we've got now that um, if we hadn't have had the COVID experience for the last two years, it would have been quite expected and reasonable to, um, you know, progress this now. Uh, but we aren't in that situation. We've got a situation where uh, the drivers have been on an extremely low um, income um, over that time. And um, that's absolutely correct. We know that to be the case. Um, and, and in those circumstances... I think we have to think, uh, are we being reasonable? And I think we need to be reasonable. Um, and it's not a very long period of time that is being um, asked for here. Um, look at, after all, look how quickly, in spite of COVID, the last two years have gone. Um, so, you know, in that sort of time frame, we will be, uh, hopefully, in, uh, or should I say the drivers will be in a position to actually then move forward. They're not asking for an indefinite stay of play. They are indicating exactly what they're, um, that they're asking us to um, support. Um, and I very much do support it. And, and after all, in the main, in the main play um, of, about the green agenda, we have to consider really that in reality, when you think of all the thousands and thousands of cars that are out there in South Cairns, that are just petrol or diesel, mine's petrol, um, and I'm, I can't afford to change my car at this moment in time. Um, and, you know, when you consider the, in reality, the small number that we're talking about, again, is it uh, realistic <coughs> and, and fair and uh, thoughtful to expect those few people to... Um, be spending money that they haven't got um, in a way that lots of us um, can't do either at this moment in time. So I think we ought to support the... Patty finds somewhere else in the building to go. 
so, so chairman so chairman i think let's be let's be helpful to the trade because after all they do provide a very important service um, in all sorts of aspects and we don't want the trade to crash um, and not be able to provide those services that they are doing so i will be supporting um the uh the question that has been posed to us by the um, this by the business people, um, you know, it's all right for us. You know, the council we, we don't have to make money uh, because our residents kindly give us their money. But these people have to go out and earn their their money. And I think we make certainly for the next two years um, we ought to be making as much effort as we can as a committee to help them. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Roberts, and a very good point, which I have a lot of sympathy with. Um, so, Councillor Wilson, could, oops, the phone's gone off. Um, Councillor Wilson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I just wanted to ask um, our public speaker, who's walking away, um, when, when a plug-in hybrid diesel car has stopped running on um, it, the charge, and reverts to diesel. What, what are the what's the rate of emissions at that point? Now, if you if you have if you have a plug-in hybrid like the other council um, uh, described, then that does happen. If you have a pure hybrid that doesn't plug it, it runs on diesel and electric all of the time. So what the, what they what generally happens with them is that when you're below 10, 12 miles an hour, they tend to run on electric at low speed. And then as you speed up, they tend to run on the diesel. So again, it helps a bit from the fact that when you're going out of town, that's what happens. Um, so, but they're always under whatever it says on the logbook, which is the 99 um, grams per kilometre, which is what people are deeming as low emissions as opposed to ultra low emissions. So that, that's the difference really. But when the, the, if you have a plug-in hybrid, when it starts running just on diesel, yeah, that uh, puts the diesel back up again a little bit. It still has a bit of so just, just to clarify, because I'm struggling to keep up here. Um, so if a diesel plug-in hybrid um, switches over from electric to diesel, is it still under 99 micrograms per kilometre? I'll be honest with you, yes, I think it says it is. I'm not sure it really is, because it's, there's still... Factory conditions. And yes, all that. factory conditions and all that. But, but you're saying... But I'm saying... Would the, it be different for a petrol? Petrols... It can get very complicated. Petrols put out less carbon dioxide than diesels do. Petrols put out lots more NOx um, gases than what diesel is. So it swaps it around, but there's lots of stories about that now. Okay, so... Hybrid is currently probably the better way where it stays on hybrid permanently. Plug-in hybrid is, again, like, like the general said, really good for commuters because you use electric only, but the driver is doing 100, 150 miles a day isn't going to stop for half an hour or an hour and charge up his battery. He's going to be running on the diesel or petrol, whatever he does on a plug-in hybrid. I think they're a little bit pointless. Hybrid is much, is much better, or pure electric or pure hydrogen. Okay, thank you. And for the benefit of the people uh, online, Councillor Bhattacharya has just joined uh, the committee. Um, Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Chair. Um, and through you, um, I, I just wanted to clarify this because um, Councillor Roberts was, was sort of, I think, um, saying that we were obliging uh, our, our drivers, who, as you've been through um, a difficult time, uh, somehow obliging them to buy a new vehicle. But what we're discussing here is one, once a driver has decided to buy a new vehicle, what sort of vehicle that should be. That's my understanding of what we're discussing here. I wonder if the chair would like to concur or um, confirm that. It's the policy that we make here enables people to carry on or not with the same car that they've got or to buy something that complies with the rules, that will comply with the rules when when they're due to renew. That's what I understand. I might have that wrong, but... Uh... Let's come back on that. So, so then, I think you're agreeing with me that this is not a question of um, obliging drivers to buy a new car when they otherwise wouldn't, because 
what this is about is if they decide to buy a new car, therefore we assume that mm. they've made the financial uh, arrangements to do that. Um, this is about what kind of car they could buy that would be compliant with our policy. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I, I understand. Yes, absolutely. That's what I am understanding too, Councillor Harvey. So thank you very much. I also noticed Councillor MacDonald has arrived. Thank you very much. Um, right. Can I just go back? Uh, all of this is really useful and informs us uh, enormously. So thank you very much. Um, I just want to clarify that there is another element in here, which is about wheelchair access, wheelchair accessible vehicles, which we'll come on to. Um, so does anybody else want to make a thought? And I, I'm also minded to come back to uh, Miss Jackson, if you want to uh, have some thoughts on that. Councillor Harvey, you put your hand up again. I have a few other points to make. Um, Firstly, in relation to um, opening up the pool of available vehicles to include um, diesel uh, ULEVs, um, and I think Mr. Clare then said actually that he would prefer um, just um, hybrids rather than um, the um, hybrid plug-in um, hybrid. Plug hybrid electric vehicles. Um, so I wondered then whether there are indeed any um, non-plug-in diesel hybrids? Um, that was one question. Um, also, um, I think when we started this process a few years ago, one of the objectives was to gradually align with City. I did check with City um, just earlier today. Um, they are not allowing um, diesel plug-in hybrids, um, but the comment was that the wording in their policy needs tightening up, but the intention is not to allow um, diesel plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. Um, I, I think, um, apart from that, I, I you know, would, would agree with Mr. Clare that, um, you know, we really um, want to go straight to our EVs if we could because, because of the problems around um, driving patterns affecting what you would actually get from you that's but um, the main point is um, uh, we really want to align with city as far as we should um, so in making this kind of special exception for diesel um, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles we'd, we'd be sort of diverging again from city that's my understanding thank you councillor harvey um councillor roberts did you want to come back yes chairman i won't take up too much of your time i hope I think we've, we get, Gremlin's back. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think we're getting bogged down in technicalities here. And I think the gentleman from, uh, who spoke originally from Panther, I'd like maybe him to come back onto the um, front again and just reiterate what he's asking for, because, um, I think it boils down to what the uh, taxi people were saying is that they, their drivers would find it impossible almost to comply with the ruling that it was supposed to be coming in um, very soon, immediately. And what he was asking for is an extension of time of two years for it to come in in 2023. Um, and again, I think that's absolutely not re uh, an unreasonable request, given the circumstances. And I think that's what's been forgotten here at the moment. Um, in, the, in the run towards the greenery, uh, we're forgetting that this is actually um, the reality of uh, what financially is going on in the taxi dr um, trade. Um, they've lost huge amounts of business from what we read in the papers, uh, paperwork, um, they still are nowhere near achieving what they were pre-COVID. And I think, you know, we, we, we really do need to um, remember that this is people's livelihoods here and that they're not being unreasonable. 
they're not saying that they aren't going to do it. They're, they're telling us when, when they believe it will be financially viable for them to do so. And I think just another couple of years, you know, we are not going to save the planet by forcing these people to um, go now and do something now, which they probably can't afford to do. Uh, and as for um, saying that we have to go along with, with Cambridge City, well, I'm sorry, we don't have to go along with Cambridge City. Uh, we have to try to do um, the best um, for the businesses in South Cambridgeshire and for the people who rely upon those services. And I say again, I think it's quite likely that if we start forcing this agenda just to match our own agenda, we'll find that we'll lose lots of these drivers, you know, because there are Cancel. other, there are, but, sorry, Chairman, but there are other businesses who are desperately looking for drivers. Mm -hmm. And if you were being told by a council that yeah. you have to spend money you don't have to update it to matching with their green criteria, then you're going to go somewhere else to work. You're going to go and be a lorry driver somewhere else. That would be very good for the lorry trade. So let's let's just get to the reality of this. Let's realise what um, we're all um, having to change our ways of doing things. These people are being very reasonable. I hope that we go with it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, can I just um, point out that the only reason we, in the past, tried to align with the city was so that drivers who work for both would be working for the same under the same conditions and it wouldn't be one thing for one authority and one thing for the other. Uh, however, in more recent years, we have undertaken to work along our own lines, but um, let's have a look. We've got Councillor Harvey again. Thank you. Well, I just wanted to reiterate the point that we're not forcing, no, exactly. we're not attempting to force taxi drivers to change to, you know, in other words, we're not trying to force them to change their existing vehicles to a new one. We're just saying that when you do, um, it should be one that's... Um, <laughs> ...moving us steadily towards um, where we'd all like to be. Thank you very much. And can I just, while we're... Before I go back to Ms Jackson, I just want to remind us that the particular bit that we're looking at here of the items that were deferred from the last committee is uh, starts on the bottom of page 12 of our agenda. It's the very last bit at the bottom of that page, existing policy vehicle restrictions at the bottom of that page, and it runs up and over onto page 13, and then other items carry on on page 13. So remember, we're, this is simply looking at the moment at the fact that we suggested, we suggested from the workshop, when we looked at it afterwards, that a new petrol, the previous principal had said a new petrol or diesel vehicle will only be granted a license if it is four years old until December 2021. Hang on, am I on the right bit? No, I'm not on the right bit. We're talking about engines, aren't we? Is that right? But we're... That's right, yes, because it refers to the, the, the length of time you've got to pay for it. So what the, the workshop proposed, a new petrol vehicle will only be granted if it is under four years old until the 1st of December 2023. Now, I just want to go back to Ms. Jackson. Can you untangle the complications here um, such that we understand which bit of this would we be either supporting or trying to amend if we said that diesel vehicles should be allowed um, to be licensed until December 2023? Thank you, Chairman. Yes, you'll be looking at, you say, uh, the current policies, it stands from 2019, I believe. A new petrol or diesel vehicle will only be granted if it's under four years old until December. Slow down December. A bit, please. Do, do slow down 20, for the audio. Apologies. So a new petrol, currently in the policy, we do state a new petrol or diesel vehicle will only be granted if it's under four years old until December 2021. Of course, the big discussion, lengthy discussion at the, the workshop as a result of the pandemic, it felt appropriate to extend the 2021 deadline to 2023. That was a unanimous decision at the workshop. Obviously, with regard to the proposal that, and that would go full stop, 
yes. it's just then changed to a new petrol vehicle will only be granted if it is under four years old until the 1st of December 2023. So we'd be purely removing the allowing a diesel engine to be licensed as of the 1st of December 2021 to the 1st of December 2023. Yeah. So only newly licensed petrol engines would be permissible until 2023 as it stands. Then, of course, we have the, uh, the request from Hanfa today, which we could obviously, if members are so minded, agree to extend that so as to read, if members were so minded, of course, a new petrol vehicle will only be granted if it is under four years old until the 1st of December 2023, or in the case of hybrid diesel or petrol vehicles, they will be granted until, uh, if they're under, um, let me think, with six. Or would, or would it be I think six a new years. petrol or diesel vehicle will only be granted if it is under four years old until the 1st of December 2023? Then you're not looking at, obviously, Mr. Clare and Andy's argument as well about having purely diesel hybrid. I thought that was a request today, was to switch to pure hybrids. Mm. Um, I don't know about anybody else, but I'm getting confused. Um, <laughs> Councillor Harvey. Thank you. Well, my understanding is if we said... Um, diesel or petrol under four years, years old until 2023, having pushed back the date for 2021, we would, we would actually be sticking with what we had previously, um, that's my understanding, which was the request for a two-year a two slippage, effectively business as usual for two years. Right. Okay. Um, sorry, did you... Councillor MacDonald. Uh, yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, so, as I understand it, and I want to clarify with Ms. Jackson as well, um, that uh, this December 2021 date for vehicles licensed for the first time is, is a diesel applicability. And in fact, the driver, if, if a driver on the 2nd of December wanted to secure a, a new license, and that was a petrol vehicle, that they would be free to do so until... December 2023. Thank you. Yes. So I just wanted to emphasize that because, it, it, in other words, it's not all or nothing. Uh, they still have the option for a petrol vehicle yes, up until 2023. Thank you for reminding us of that. Right. Um, I'm slightly nervous that if we move on to the other subjects, we might forget that nub of useful information. But I do think we ought to perhaps go through the other things. So, you know, we've had a ruminations about that, but there are other elements in here that we also need to take in uh, to, to make decisions on. And we will come to this one um, shortly, unless members would like to take that particular one now. But I do. Yes, yeah, OK. Right. Um, so, so, Jane, could, could I make a, a move that um given the words that um, sorry could i just suggest that we just go back to what it says in the agenda so the request was that no new applications of a diesel vehicle will be approved from 1st of december 2021 and that was the outcome of our workshop where we worked all around it and thought about it but we have had new information useful information about how vehicles work. So the question we're likely to ask on that one, and I will refer you to this element on pages 12 and 13, is whether we think we should be allowing granting of new licenses uh, for vehicles It's kind of the inverse of what we're asking, isn't it? Um, whether, whether, Ms. Jackson, would you help me? How can we phrase this? So, because we, we don't actually have um, the recommendation here. I mean, we, we, we've been asked to uh, support the recommendations of the members' workshop, which was to, that came out, hang on, 
Excellency. Page nine. Yes, Chair, if I may, the yeah, recommendation do. from your workshop was to remove to permit the licensing of new petrol vehicle engines until uh, which are up to four years old until the first of December twenty twenty three. Yeah. Otherwise a driver would now, well as of later on this week, not be able to license any vehicle unless it was ULEV or zero emission. So it's to enable that flexibility as a result of the pandemic, the workshop agreed that a new petrol vehicle would be able to be licensed, provided it was under four years old, until the 1st of December 2023. And the effect of that is to not allow a new diesel vehicle. But as Councillor MacDonald has pointed out, people could switch to a petrol vehicle as a new licensed vehicle at that time. That would be correct, Chair, yes. Okay. So, members, um, I propose we... Uh, sorry, Councillor Handley. Um, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the, the argument from the Member of Public is that, that we should be tweaking our this uh, to allow plug-in hybrid diesels. That's the, that's the yes. only difference from what was suggested at the workshop. Now, what Councillor Hunt has told us, who's a, who's a driver of, uh, of hybrid plug-in vehicles, um, what he's saying is that effectively, if, if we allow that, that diesel engines, uh, you know, the, that they will not plug in and charge their batteries, a battery which will only take them 40, 50 miles. So a, a vehicle that's doing 150, 200 miles a day professionally, it's going to be effectively a diesel car, yes. not an electric car. So I can't see the point of doing it. I really can't. No, and, and I tend to agree. And indeed, Mr. Clare made the point, and indeed, Mr. Cundell made the point that um, that is not the way the car would be used. Uh, so we've got questions from Councillor Roberts and Councillor Hunt. Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chairman, again. Um, I think that uh, the uh, comments that um, our officer made um, and explained it should be the motion, which was the two parts, the going up to 2023, and then the additional, new, which was what, what the uh, workshop agreed, and then the addition of the, the hybrid as well. So it's, it's um, I would say this is now a two-part motion, the first, the, which was recommendation of the group, and then this new addition today, which is about the hybrids. Um, and I think we're getting too tied up with okay, um, so, so people going to be using petrol or whatever. Okay, so... Let's do it like that then. So if we make the first part of this um, as worded on the top of page 13, uh, looking at that, so uh, that a new petrol vehicle, this is the outcome of the workshop. Yeah. Um, so the new petrol vehicle will only be granted a license if it is under four years old until the 1st of December 2023. Yeah. Would everybody like to indicate whether they support that or not? Sorry? Oh, sorry, okay. Sorry, fair, fair point, fair point. Um, Councillor Hunt, sorry, yes. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to follow on from Councillor Handley's comment. I think, I, I think, first of all, the, the thing we're about to vote on would not prevent you registering a hybrid of any sort. I mean, a, a, a plug-in hybrid diesel or a plug-in hybrid petrol or an ordinary hybrid, I will not use the term self-charging, that's marketing nonsense, an ordinary hybrid, uh, they're all covered by this. You could register any of those um, until 2023. So I don't really see why we would need to... Um, oh, and I suppose I do see the difference that the, that the industry uh, representatives would like to have the diesel option until 2023. Um, I would come back to my point that I think if we were to allow that, Specifying that the plug-in may be an own goal environmentally, and it may indeed be the case that an ordinary hybrid is better when driven 150 miles a day than a plug-in one, as well as being significantly cheaper. So, Councillor Hunt, if we had proposals as follows, does, I, I'm saying this not because I want to ask for your agreement, but that, that I've understood it correctly. Um, so, if our question A was 
whether we supported a new petrol vehicle will only be granted a license if it's under four years old until the 1st of December 2023, and we vote on that. And then secondly, part B, we look at whether we would be happy for new diesel plug-in hybrids to be granted a license if they're under four years old until the 1st of December 2023. I wonder whether the industry representatives would rather remove the word plug-in from that and just say hybrid. Just say hybrid. Because that would, actually, that would actually enable both, because they're technically both covered by that, and then a judgment could be made based on you know, the actual uh, operating conditions that an individual driver typically, somebody who's mostly in the near, nearby villages, perhaps would benefit from a plug-in, or somebody who goes further afield regularly wouldn't. Um, so, but the, the, the crucial point was diesel. So, so, so is the wording then that we're struggling for a, a new hybrid will only be granted if it is under four years old until the 1st of December 2020? I think if you were to say that, that would cover it, yes. So, so let me just get the wording. So a new hybrid vehicle Brackets, which could be either electric or petrol. You don't have to put Leave that the brackets in. brackets out because we don't need yeah, to say it because yeah. it's obvious. But sorry, I don't mean to be rude. Uh, it, could, right. it could cover both. Yeah. Um, a new hybrid vehicle will only be granted if it is under four years old until 1st of December 2023, which sounds a bit bonkers because... Oh, I've got thumbs up at the other end. That's good. Um, but, of course, probably the only ones there are <laughs> are under four years old. Um, Get the wording. Aaron, have you got that wording? Oh, okay. Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Chair. Through you, um, I wondered if Councillor Hunt would clarify whether, when, if we were to replace or if we were to, to, to allow hybrid vehicles, would that then allow plug in hybrid vehicles? Um, I thought we'd agreed generally um, be a bad idea. It's very hard to know. If we my, want to say pure hybrid. Do well, we want to say the, the, pure? There's no very good term for this because the industry uses different terms for, from different manufacturers. But let's say a non plug in hybrid, one that you do not charge up from the mains, has a small battery and is only recovering kinetic energy to reuse. That's what you would call like a Toyota Prius, the original types of hybrids, which are very popular with, with, with the trade. Um, Sorry, to Councillor Harvey's question. It's really hard to know what to put here because I do not have a good understanding of the usage patterns of cabbies. I would assume they're driving quite long shifts and probably driving 100 more miles a day. I don't have, because they don't publish it, information about what the efficiency of these vehicles are once they run out of battery. You kind of only get this one number. So it's very hard to judge, you know, honestly, whether you're better off with a plug-in or not. Um, okay, I mean, so what, what I would say is I would favour petrol plug-ins and petrol ordinary hybrids over these or anything because of particulates and so forth. Although I do take the gentleman's point about um, selective catalysts and, uh, and, and add fuel prudence. Oh dear, we are getting into technical... I'm sorry, but we're being asked to make we, a technical decision. Can we... Can we um, understand what part B of this might be, um, that it might be uh, all new. Now, we could go very specific. We could say all new non-plug-in brackets, petrol or diesel hybrid vehicles under four years old until 1st of December 2023. Or we could just say all new non-plug-in hybrid vehicles under four years, etc. Or we could say all new hybrid vehicles under four years. Um, uh, Chairman, yes, I'm sorry. totally lost now. I have no idea where we are. No, so, I don't either. So, 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 no, actually, so can we come to no, no, Sorry, sorry Councillor Hall, I do know where we are. I want to speak to, I want Rachel Jackson to speak. Thank you, Chairman. I just wanted to remind yourself and your committee as well, there was one of a caveat regarding allowing the licensing of diesel vehicles and this was we are in a serious issue with regard to a lack of wheelchair accessible vehicles yes, in our exactly. district mm -hmm. um, so much so, so that we're actually having to 
refer people who are unable to use community transport, for example, to Cambridge to get a wheelchair accessible taxi, because obviously the makeup of our district, we haven't got taxi ranks, we haven't really got the nighttime economy to support use of, you know, the London style wheelchair accessible vehicles. We've actually got six hackney carriages, which are all saloon vehicles. So we're expecting with a change that we'll lose those six and they'll become private hire. So we'll end up with probably a handful currently of wheelchair accessible vehicles. They may be specialist vehicles that are used for home to school and transports with a tail lift at the back. And obviously companies such as Panther provide a very vital home to school service for the county council and for vulnerable children. And I know this was a, a separate add-on, unfortunately, to the workshop came from Panther, but I know Councillor Wilson and Councillor Bradman were supportive of the notion that we need to support as far as possible the availability of wheelchair accessible vehicles. So an agreement in principle by the, the chair and the vice chair was to continue to allow diesel, yeah. hybrid or not, just diesel engine vehicles, wheelchair accessible vehicles to be continued to be licensed to 2023. So that was another part. So you've got the free That's pass right. chair. So you have yeah. got an agreement that you've already made at your, uh, the workshop, which was a new petrol vehicle will only be granted if it is under four years old until the 1st of December 2023. You're up for discussion. Sorry, before you go on yes. from that, that's the element on page 12 and 13. That's correct. Okay. Yes. The, the wheelchair accessible bit is on page 10. And that is where we had agreed that vehicles related, the vehicles related amendments. So this is the bit at the bottom of the page, proposal hackney carriage vehicles 3.6C and 3.16. Ah, no, sorry, Chair, that's regarding to hackney carriages only. This part okay. here we're talking about is where Panther are using a private hire vehicle, which is say a Leyland uh, transport, uh, transport kind of vehicle, a um, ah. Ford Trans adapted to carry wheelchair passengers. So that is, this is private hire fleet, not the handy carriage, so that's separate. Sorry, I'm just trying to find, did we look at this in the workshop or has it come up since? No, this was subsequent to the workshop. Okay. This was the first additional request from Panther that came to yourself and to Councillor Wilson, who was supportive of, uh, supportive of the idea that we need to maintain yes. as much as possible wheelchair accessible vehicles. Okay, so the point being that if we want to maintain even what we have, which is very few wheelchair accessible vehicles, we have to continue to allow those to be first licensed if it's for under four years old until the 1st of December 2023 that because that's yes. the only way we're going to keep a reasonable supply of wheelchair accessible vehicles Absolutely. available. Excuse me a minute. So I can see Councillor Handley. There are some people Harvey, please. Councillor Harvey. Um, I, I just, um, I could just park the wheelchair accessible vehicle for a moment. Um, Mr. Clare, um, I was hoping might clarify whether, in fact, any non-plug-in hybrid vehicles that are also diesel are available, um, because otherwise, effectively, if we say hybrid to include plug-in hybrid, that means effectively, and, and we include diesels, we, we, we then know that they will actually be plug-in diesels, which I think we've, we've kind of decided would be not beneficial from either the air quality point of view or the um, CO2 emissions point of view. So, so are there actually any um, vehicles that are available um, which are uh, either, depending on the terminology, self-recharging or, or standard hybrid diesels as opposed to plug-in hybrid vehicles that are diesels? Would Mr. Kundal be able to respond to that? Uh, yes, I could. And yes, there are vehicles that are uh, just hybrid, not necessarily plug-in hybrid, um, that are diesel as well as hybrid. And just maybe something to make it easier for you, when these plug-ins run out of electric, they are still hybrids. They don't stop being hybrids at that point. They are still hybrids. So it makes the, it is the plug-in makes the, is, is the expensive problem, to be fair. It needs to be just hybrid. Doesn't matter whether it's plug-in or not. The drivers aren't going to buy plug-in ones because they can't afford them. They're brand new motors. They're thirty grand to throw. So, that, from that point of view, it makes no difference. Um, so yes, yeah, so they are available. 
Um, and if I may get the chance when you're talking about the wheelchair thing shortly, I would like to join in with that because it's a, a wider problem than you probably realise it is. Oh, I thought you were going to expand on that. I'm very happy to expand on it now if you wish me to, but we currently are the only firm that I'm aware of that are supplying or even attempting to supply wheelchairs in the city or in South Cams to anybody other than for the social services ones. We already don't have enough of them. We have a great shortage. We are currently quoting a minimum of an hour to do one. If someone wants a specialist wheelchair accessible vehicle, i.e. a solid frame or a rear loading vehicle, they are waiting an hour and a half to two hours for one. We, and if you like, and I've had the conversation with City as well, if you, you need to allow us to carry on running diesels at the moment because they don't make a wheelchair accessible vehicle other than the London taxi, which is an, is an old different technology, um, and they're £60,000 to throw. The drivers aren't going to buy those because it's just ridiculous. Um, if you don't allow us to carry on using diesels, and furthermore, in my opinion, you need to drop the four-year rule very urgently as well, because we are very soon going to be in the same boat as the other companies that you license and say, sorry, we do not have any wheelchair vehicles available, and nobody will be getting them because we are not going to be able to afford to run them. We can't get the drivers to do the work because they're not allowed to get any extra money for doing the jobs, even though they take a lot longer and the driver has a lot more responsibility for wheeling people in and out of the vehicle. The driver can't get paid for that. And now we've got to the point where we're becoming busier again. There's a driver shortage. The drivers are just par driving past these jobs. So we can't make them do them. And these people are just getting stuck for hours, out in the cold sometimes. We're begging drivers to go and do the work. Okay. And Mr. they won't Kandel, let us. And they won't that's go and do really it. helpful. So what you're saying is that currently... The only wheelchair accessible vehicles we have are diesel. No, I'm saying there are a few petrol, but it's 99% diesel. Mostly diesel. Yes. Okay. So if we uh, enforce this proposed A, that a new petrol vehicle will only be granted if it's under four years old until 1st of December 23, thereby excluding diesels, we will get rid of all our WAVs, won't we? Wheel wheelchair accessible vehicles. You, you, obviously, they won't go immediately because they carry no, on using But if they, as they wear out or if they get damaged so they cannot be used, the driver will, will not be able to replace that vehicle, correct? Could he replace it with a petrol wheelchair accessible vehicle? If he gets very lucky, and I do mean very lucky, there are very few and far between. Because most of them are built specifically for the cab trade, they're always diesel, because that's been the yeah. thing to buy forever and a day. You do get a few mobility ones that are petrol, but again, it's very few and far between. Thank you very much. Okay, right. Mr. Cham Chairman. Right. Councillor Handley had his hand up, and Councillor Hull. Um. Yeah, I'm really concerned about this. I, I think the wheelchair accessible vehicle thing was one that I would have a lot of sympathy with allowing to change changing what we do with those for the reasons that this gentleman's laid out what i'm less happy <laughs> what i'm less happy about is allowing diesel engined hybrids to be uh, relicensed because the reason we uh, decided not to treat them in the same way as we treated the petrol version was because of the particulates which cause us problems in the city. And that problem hasn't gone away. That's still the same problem. And I don't think we should be legislating for that, for, you know, to, to allow them, in my opinion, uh, whether they plug in or not. You know, if they've got an engine, they're causing problems. And uh, so I think we should just stick to the plan that we had coming out of the workshop um, and I would just leave you with the thought that, you know, if the city council is going to ban diesel engines of all kinds, if someone buy, you know, a, 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 an operator buys one who's based in South Cams, he won't be able to take it into the city anyway. Exactly. So he's not going to, he or she is not going to want to do it. Mm. 
So and, and that was I, I think we just we should stop getting hung up on this. We, we've spent too much time on it already, in my opinion. And we need to. And we just need to make a decision now. So you'd be happy simply to vote. I don't mean simply. Uh, I think we should. We should on, run on the, with on the outcomes of the workshop as we had them written. Yes. Yeah. I think so. Thank you, Councillor Hull. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman, I'd like to make a proposal that we allow diesel wheelchair accessible vehicles to continue to be licensed until December 2023. That's my proposal. Okay, so the inverse of... Well, hang on a minute. No, that's not quite how we need to put it because it, the way the policy is written at the moment is written in terms of... Um, uh, by, by default and by elimination so I'm, I'm saying if, chairman the note which is on page 13 I'm yes so that, that a new petrol you're saying no no I'm saying we allow diesel wheelchair accessible vehicles to continue to be licensed until or if you wish to as you say um in, two, in December 2023 all wheelchair accessible vehicles should be um uh, hybrid so so council how how about if we go with a the a new, sorry, a new petrol vehicle will only be granted if it is under four years old until 1st of December 2023. B, we, or rather, and as part of this, and, but we allow diesel wheelchair accessible vehicles to continue to be licensed until December 2023. I'm happy with that, Chairman. Okay. Uh, right. Are members minded to take a vote on that? Uh, are members minded to vote on that? But Chairman, where where is the part that we, which was going to be B, which was about well, the I think, hybrids? I think, well, I mean, do I don't because think what we need that. I don't know whether we need that if, uh, well, the other option was a new hybrid vehicle can be licensed if it's under four years until the 1st of December 2023. That would have been an addition to what we said at the workshop. Um, but the workshop, following the workshop, we add in this allow diesel wheelchair accessible vehicles to continue because there are so few of those vehicles, as Councillor Roberts pointed out, that although they are going into the city, there are very few of them. So are we happy with... Um, well, I'm, I'm sorry, Jim, and I, I think... I think we're muddying the waters here. I think we've got one question to answer first, which is about um, the petrol uh, going on till 2023 with the addition of the wheelchair part, which Councillor Howell has put forward. Then we should have a secondary vote, which is about the hybrids. Um, clearly, the first part is about following up from the... Uh, the uh, submission of the of the working party of the um, of the group uh, but this is the second part which has been brought to so, the table today okay, so, so, so for clarity councillor roberts are you saying that that second part if we accept that the first part includes the element about the diesel wheelchair and the second part then reiterates the wording but changes it slightly of the first part and says a new hybrid vehicle yeah. under four years old can be licensed up until the 1st of December 2023. Yes, Chairman, that's what I would propose. Okay. Aaron, do you have the wording for that? <laughs> <laughs> so if I just, just run through that. So the first part will be a new petrol vehicle will only be granted a license if it is under four years old until the 1st of December 2023. We allow diesel or some appropriate wording to be agreed with Rachel Jackson, um, we allow diesel wheelchair accessible vehicles to continue to be licensed until December 2023. Yes. And then the third part is a new hybrid vehicle uh, will only be granted a license if it is under four years old until the 1st of December 2023. Councillor yes. MacDonald. Just, just in, um, uh, I mean, Councillor Roberts proposed it just needs a seconder. I think um, I won't be seconding, but but I think it needs a seconder. Okay, so 
So um, if we say that Councillor Roberts proposed the, well, actually, I thought I proposed it, in fact, <laughs> some time ago. <laughs> uh, but with the addition that uh, Councillor Howells has put in, uh, that's fine, Councillor Roberts, if you want to propose it. Um, uh, so the new petrol vehicle will only be granted it a license if it is under four years old until 1st of December 2023. How should we put this, Rachel? And allow, but we allow diesel wheelchair accessible vehicles to continue to be I, licensed? I think, Chair, just for clarity and for me relaying this information to the trade, I'd be quite happy if we had it as three separate parts. Okay. So it, to mirror it, really, so I should say a new petrol vehicle will then be granted. Only so that Aaron can make sure it's not so right. <laughs> yes. So this is, uh, yeah, so a new petrol vehicle will only be granted if it is under four years old until the 1st of December 2023. Was there? Oh, okay. Yep. Point two or A or whatever we're looking at the policy. A new diesel wheelchair accessible vehicle will only be granted if it's under four years old until the 1st of December 2023. Yeah. And C. Yeah. A new hybrid vehicle will only be granted if it is under four years old until the 1st of December 2023. Great. Yeah. Okay. Lovely. Members, would you prefer, can you just indicate whether you would prefer to take those one at a time or whether you'd be happy to take them all at once? One at a time. Okay. So, Rachel, would you like to read out number A then? And we'll vote on it, members, by show of hands, please. Thank you, Chair. And it, um, I just note that Councillor Claire Dalderfield will not be able to vote because she's not here in the room. Okay. Um, so... Part A, thank you, Chair. A new petrol vehicle will only be granted if it is under four years old until the 1st of December 2023. So do we, can, we, can we take the numbers? So it's one, two, three, four. That's unanimous. Okay, lovely. Thank you. So that's by unanimous. Rachel, if you could read the second part. Thank you. A new diesel wheelchair accessible vehicle will only be granted if it is under four years old until the 1st of December, 2023. That's unanimous. And Thank right. you, and the final, a new hybrid vehicle will only be granted if it is under four years old until 1st of December, 2023. Um, I haven't decided. Oh, so it's unanimous. Mm -hmm. oh, apart from what? Apart from Council Handy? Did you have your hand up? It, so those are all take, carried unanimously. Oh, no, the oh. uh, Councillor McDonald voted against, so I didn't, didn't vote for that. Last Did you abstain? No, so um, whatever that is, minus one. One abstention. Right, thank you. Do you know what? When I saw these papers, I knew it was going to be a bit like that. So thank you very much um, for bearing with us on that complicated thing. Now, can we go back um, to page nine and go through the elements that we agreed at the workshop that are really being brought here for ratification? So... Um, so this first element, do you, do you want to carry this through, Rachel, or shall I? I'm quite happy, Chair, if you wish to go through, because I say I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that members spent an awful lot of time at the workshop, which okay. is really valuable, but I feel, as you say, Chair, it's just to ratify the decision. So hopefully okay. you'll be able to do that exactly. section by section. Yeah. Thank you. Lovely. Okay, so this first element is to do with existing policy on safeguarding and... Um, it was agreed at the workshop. Uh, previously, it said that they must operators, drivers, and vehicle proprietors must undertake safeguarding course within 12 months of the policy, uh, and then um, annual. And we've now proposed at the workshop that all existing drivers, vehicle proprietors, and operators undertake a safeguarding course within 12 months, and all new applicants prior to licensing and. A, a refresher course will be required. Thank you very much. Do we all agree with that? Yeah. 
Agreed. Um, the only element we need to check on that, Ms. Jackson, is that we obviously need to procure um, a training course for that or arrange to do it in-house. So there's, we, we have, during the pandemic, we arranged to provide uh, external providers of the course, such as Bernardo's and the Blue Lamp. So these are all verified organisers who provide safeguarding training for us. Are they, they are appropriate courses for drivers in this scenario? Absolutely, very, very okay. um, specific. And obviously there's always scope to look at bringing it back in-house in the future, should that be an option for say, right now we're using uh, appropriate professional providers. Great, thank you. thank you. So that first one on safeguarding is agreed. <clears throat> so the next one is on policy on driving experience. This is a number of years. Um, and we agreed, <laughs> we all agreed <laughs> that we want our drivers to have 12 months experience and that they should be no less than 20 years of age. This would have the effect. Um, the third one on page 10 is reference 2.6. This is to remove the requirement for references and indeed the trade agreed this and said it was um, not very useful. So we agreed that. Okay, so that's agreed. The proposal at section 2.23 of the policy, the surrender of licenses, this seemed absolutely important to me. Um, so are we agreed on that? Agreed, lovely. Uh, the element proposal, which was for hackney carriage vehicles, um, yes, that's right. We had had a requirement in our policy that all taxis would be wheelchair accessible since 2019, but it's not been effectively implemented. Uh, we also had said that existing Hackney carriages were to be white and WAV um, by December 2023, is that right? And we agreed to align the vehicle related amendments all to 1st of December 2023. So are you all happy with that? Yes, yeah, lovely. lovely. Next one, slightly more tricky, um, 3.12, the Certificate of Compliance. This is to do with the vehicles. Way back in the midst of time, um, vehicles had a Certificate of Compliance once every 12 months, and then for some reason we, it was changed to six monthly. Um, but because we have now implemented the maximum age limit for vehicles, um, it seemed more sensible to bring that back to 12 months again so that all of these tests could be done at the same time in the same location when cars were getting their MOTs. So we, uh, at the workshop, we said could that come back so that we could think about it being uh, returned to being 12 monthly. Mr Jackson, do you want to give some narrative on that? I just feel it's a very sensible option. In 2019, it was moved to be a six monthly MOT as compliance and I think a lot of the workshop attendees were very supportive of the notion that a 12-month MOT is sufficient for the trade but of course with a small caveat there if we have any concerns about reported roadworthiness of the vehicle either on an enforcement officer's check then of course if we're required to do a full new MOT or if there's any advisories that are causing us concern when MOT is provided that would insist on it but as I say we didn't really need a sledgehammer approach when it's been working and, well for the and those um, concerns would be what reported by members of the public? Potentially members of the public, obviously councillors themselves or enforcement officers when we're doing our visits as well. So anywhere at all, any concern whatsoever, we would just insist on the MOT, probably give them penalty points and the vehicle probably would be suspended in any case until the MOT is provided. So lots of safety mechanisms to be in place. Okay, Chair. so members, does anybody, is, are we all agreed with that? Good, excellent. So back to 12 months again. Um, obviously, uh, on page 11, 3.16, making our terms respectful um, is important. So we've changed the terming to terms to wheelchair users. Um, thank you. 3.19, exempt vehicles. Um, this was to delete the words and plate. Um, so that an alternative identification could be sourced in line with the review of plate production materials. At that time, we refused the removal, but we agreed to amend to read and plate or identification. 
and that was to ensure that any alternative system does not compromise customer safety or visibility of identification of the vehicle. So are we happy to um, go with that? I know we thrashed it out quite, quite thoroughly at the workshop. Um, moving on to 3.27 age limits, this was to stipulate a nine-year age limit for all vehicles from December 2021, but to consider moving that to, to December 2023, and that was agreed in order to support the trade, um, and that was a reasonable step. So are we all agreed, members? Okay. Um, yes, I, I'm slightly concerned about this 3.27, deleting the reference made to aligning the City of Cambridge policy. I, I hear what Councillor Roberts says, but I actually um, feel there are very good reasons for at least endeavouring to align with the City of Cambridge policy. So I'm not so sure about that one. What do members feel? Councillor Handley? I think I, we, we should aspire to be the same, but I don't think it needs to be put in the document. I, I don't think we need to make reference to it in it. Okay. Fair enough. Um, okay, so yes, we, so we do try to keep aligned, but we don't put it in the policy. Fair enough. And members wish to see continued partnership working, but fair enough. Okay, so we've agreed that. Has everybody agreed on that? That we work it as an uh, as aspirational thing. Um, the reference to the particular angle of doors was no longer referred to because these were actually largely sliding doors, I think, in the end. So we agreed to remove that. Um, Appendix D1, which was, this was to do with, Rachel, Ms. Jackson, can you remind us, this is to do with um, SUV type vehicles, isn't it? That's right, SUVs, SUVs and MPVs, which have, say, an additional row of seats in the back, which may be suitable for, say, a small child or someone who's very, very short. But basically, the, the comfort and also the lack of access to a door is a concern. So there's a, an accident in the vehicle. They would have to clamber over the middle passengers, and it was felt. This is kind of agreed and not agreed within, within our neighbouring authorities, but I think it's a very sensible and safe approach. We've only, thank goodness, only had one report of any incident over the last six, seven years, I believe. Um, and it wasn't a serious accident, but it brings to life the, the principle of making sure our passengers are as safe as possible. Thank you. Um, is this going to be it? Yes, I think so. I'm just slightly concerned that in the current policy, there doesn't seem to be a 3.27. It seems to go as far as... Oh, hang on, no, I'm in the wrong bit. Somebody can give me the page number. That would be great. What, 51, Thank you. Oh, here we are. Yes. Uh, yes, 51 in the policy. Yes, it's all... Um, yes, this is, this, is this is to do with maximum number of seats, though. And there it is. However, um, I think we agreed that at the workshop. So are members happy to accept that? Yeah. Great, okay. Moving on, page 12. Um, Regarding the code of conduct, um, we simply did a bit of tidying up of the, the wording. Um, so we removed duplications and that was agreed at the workshop. So are members happy with that? Um, under the Appendix E, the private hire exemptions, um, we removed, and it refers back to the item we, we've already agreed, we removed the word plate and replaced it with notice and replaced notice with certificate. And we made some amendments to make the exempt driver's uh, requirements uh, in line with the rest of the policy. So are members happy with that? Uh, in the driver handbook, we looked at the competency test to provide an external provider 
Um, and also to think about, in the workshop we agreed we needed to add in online assessments where they were available. Okay. Are we agreed? Um, and also the administrative corrections in the paperwork. That's at 34. And under the DBS, um, we were reassured that there was no compromise to the existing standard checks um, and this was an administrative amendment only. This was to do with how people record their stay in touch with their DBS check. Okay, so looking at vehicle license, uh, sorry, vehicle restrictions. So this is the bit I think that we've just covered already. Um, on page 13, right, here we come to the license will not be renewed for a petrol or diesel vehicle unless it's nine, less than nine years old and at least Euro 5 emission standard until December 2023. Now, we agreed that at the workshop. Good, okay, so we're agreed here. Then any newly licensed vehicle must be ULEV or zero emission from December 2021. And we discussed at length the elements of that. And we agreed it was appropriate to move the implementation date to the 1st of December 2023, which aligns with the other agreements we've made. So members, thank you very much. I think that comes to the end of the policy. Is there anything you'd like to add, Ms Jackson? No, Chair, thank you so much everybody for their patience as well in helping me to get our policy a bit more fit for purpose in light of the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Harvey. Yes, I, I just wanted to note that you, um, just the paragraph that we just looked at, any new licensed vehicle must be ULEV or zero emission now from 2023. Um, there will be a sort of discontinuity of our um, specification, um, given what we've just agreed in relation to what would apply up until 2023, which, which I thought was a sensible compromise. But I think the, um, the reason it was a sensible, sensible compromise was because, as Mr. Clare said, um, allowing um, hybrid as opposed to ULEV um, is, 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 a, is an improvement in terms of um, the amount of emissions we will create because of Councillor Hunt's point that actually if we said ULEV, um, that would have to be a plug-in hybrid. And as we've agreed, plug-in hybrids with a taxi use pattern um, would not achieve the, the sort of advertised number on the tin, if you like. Um, so, so, Councillor Harvey, what we need from you is some alteration of the words that would make this more manageable for you or more um, coherent with the rest of the policy that we've just agreed? Is there any way that... Uh, well, I've just... I'm, what, what I'm, not suggesting, I'm not suggesting we sort of address this today, but I'm just pointing out that... Um, that there will, there will now be a sort of, and perhaps it's something we need to revisit before so, 2023. So, okay, so what you said, you, you, you used the word, there will be a discontinuity between yes, because previously agreed elements of the policy and this. So can we minute that we want to look at this again um, at some point yes. um, so that we, before, before December 2023, obviously, so that we can look at how we can minimise that discontinuity? Yes, um, and, and I think we don't know how the technology would develop between now and you know, the next couple of years, but um, I just think it would be worth reviewing that within the next year or two, obviously before 2023. So can we minute that? that we would like to look at it within the next year or two. I, I would agree. Okay. Councillor Bhattacharya. Yeah, um, I'm a person on the page number 12 on the, on the DBS. Yeah, what you say? Could, could, could you, could you bring the microphone a bit closer? Thank you. Yeah, I have a question on the page number 12 regarding, regarding the DBS check. The DBS check. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a general inquiry from me. What is the renewal period or the time for, uh, for the DBS checking? Annually or three years or five years? Um, Ms. Jackson, okay. so what is the um, time frame on which DBS checks are rechecked? 
please. There is a requirement under the Department for Transport uh, regulations that were published last July, or July 2020 rather, that DBS check statuses are checked every six months. So that is something we're in the process of currently. So when a driver applies for his license, that's obviously a three-year license, but then they must uh, subscribe to the DBS update service. So when we check on that system, we can then see whether there's been any change to their DBS status. So when you say the DBX uh, renewal, so do you mean the six months? Every six months, no, no. they are getting the new DBS certificate? No, it's every three years. When somebody applies for, the, for license, they then provide as a, the DBS check. But they have to uh, apply every year. They have to subscribe to the DBS. So they have to keep their ongoing subscription alive. If we find out, when we're doing a routine check, that that DBS subscription has been cancelled, then that license will be suspended. Yeah, so that's another safeguard for us. So, so any um, misdemeanors that would show up on the DBS check would is, is refreshed every six months. So any um, complaint or concern would come up when we did a, you know, a, a, an investigation as to somebody's complaint. So thank you very much, members. Um, I appreciate we've been going for an hour and a half. Does anybody want to break before we go on into the the the, the, um, the uh, street trading element? Right. Okay. So this deals with our street trading policy uh, and. Well, yes, exactly. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for attending. It's extremely useful to have your input. Thank you. Thank you. So, members, a few minutes while we wait for Councillor Handy to come back. I said, are we always going to stop when somebody now leaves? Are we now going to stop the committee if somebody leaves? That's what I'm asking. In the future. Sorry, I thought that's what you'd asked me to do. He's here. Good. Okay. So item five then, street trading policy. Uh, Ms. Jackson, would you like to present your report? Thank you, Chair, and thank you, committee. Members are asked to approve in principle the draft policy for consultation. Unfortunately, it was not possible for me to obtain council opinion regarding the introduction of the host premises consent. So, oh. uh, I'm expecting to receive this information uh, later on this week or early next week. Um, however, what I'm requesting today is that members consider the draft and approve, enable for me to start the consultation process. I did discuss with Paul this morning about the idea of should we wait until we receive the council opinion, but Paul's advice was, very sensible as always, was the response from council regarding the notion of host premises, which is in, within our policy, should just be a matter that we consider with the rest of the consultation responses. And just to obviously placate or perhaps address any concerns members may have, as you'll note, we enlisted the legal advice of Pops and Allen, one of the country's leading licensing law firms, who obviously read through the policy, made a few comments, but have confirmed it is fit for purpose as far as they are concerned. So if there are no questions, Chair. Um, sorry, so can yes. we just start from the beginning? <laughs> huh? Which was that we currently have a policy that um, means that there are a few identified streets in South Cambridgeshire which are called consent streets. And counterintuitively, that means people have to ask for consent before they are permitted to trade. And that consent is consulted on by the district council, but also the parish council. This proposal seeks to make all of the roads in the district under that criteria so that Anybody wishing to trade anywhere has to seek consent. But 
with certain caveats that certain locations might be, um, as it were, uh, given a host license. Would you like to give us the background to how it, the structure of, of the new proposal? Of course, yeah. The only idea is, of course, to make it across the board fair. So wherever you wish to trade within the district, you are subject to the same uh, regime, street trading consent regime. What we're trying to allow is some flexibility, which is about host premises, which is a new concept that we borrowed thanks to our colleagues at East Cambridge. They've actually um, agreed earlier on this month the notion of host premises within their policy. However, obviously, I'm just waiting to hear the confirmation from our further legal advice regarding the legality of this. But as I say, the idea will be it's a caterers association, came with the proposal. We have food trucks, food parks, etc. These mobile units that you might see in the White Lion one night for two hours, then the Rose and Crown two days later. It's to allow the flexibility, almost like a passport. So the, the idea would be a pub or a B&Q car park, for example, would apply to have their, their private premises or car park uh, designated as a host premise. And then this would allow people to get the license from us, a consent license from us, and then they can go and trade freely in each specific host premises area. So it's, it's like a passport, really, but a flexibility. So the principle yes. of licensing is that the host is entitled to seek permission for their land to be used. Correct. And the second part that works alongside it is the individual trader seeks permission to be using that land. Absolutely. And that, that permission is from both the host, but also from the parish councils, as usual? Oh, of course, yeah. I mean, yeah. It was still the, the whole um, consultation exercise would still very much remain, but it's to allow some flexibility. So there'll be a couple of new ideas. The host premises is new, it is novel. Um, so that would be the one approach. Then, of course, the consent. So you're on the, the high street, for example, um, that would be subject to the standard street trader consent. But as I say, the whole idea is to bring it in line so it's fair, transparent, and of course, equitable. And obviously, we're not cost prohibitive because the last thing we want to do is these premises, these traders which have been trading for maybe several years without the need for a license, all of a sudden don't be told by heavy handed licensing officers that this is going to cost you several hundred pounds. We want to support the local economy and, you know, continue promoting and supporting the businesses which have been providing a lifeline for our local communities. But I say it's being fair and uh, transparent. Thank you. And Ms Jackson, could you also just clarify, are you saying that the legal advice is that we can make a decision on this today? Absolutely. Or, or are we you are, to delay? Yes. Well, if Paul wishes to address, I don't know. If Paul, you wish to? Mr. Mr. The Wells. question for today is whether or not you can go out to consultation. Okay. There's no reason to delay the consultation to get council's advice. In fact, central government guidance is we should consult for as long as we possibly can. Yes. So why delay the kickoff? Good. Okay, that's lovely. So we can think about that sensibly. Councillor Howell, you had a question earlier. On. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman, I think if you look in recommendation three, uh, where we've already put it in the Cambridge News and no representations were received, give us a good indication there that uh, this isn't going to be that contentious, he says, hopefully. Um, however, um, I have, about 15, 20 years ago, had some streets in Papworth. I had the opportunity of getting them made to consent streets because we had a problem there. And um, that was done. It worked exceptionally well, and it's been like that today. So I, um, uh, Chairman, propose that we do go out to consultation, taking on board what Council says as part of that consultation, along with other people at the time. Mm -hmm. Thank and you, indeed, Jamie. yes, thank you. And indeed, um, years ago, I was part of a uh, consultation, a, 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 a hearing where there was a consent street, and it made the whole um, process much easier. Um, the, the, form, the formal ways of, of consulting the various different stakeholders made it much easier. Uh, Councillor Roberts. Um, just to say, Chairman, that at page... 154 at um, options at thir paragraph 13, which is uh, what Councillor Howell has proposed. I will second it. I recommend that the policy is circulated for public consultation. Thank you, Chair.
Yes, and indeed that's uh, exactly what I was going to propose myself. So um, that's fine. Um, so members, any other, any, let's open it for debate. If it's, if it's been proposed, I'm quite happy that Councillor Roberts proposes it. And is that something with a Councillor Hand who has a hand raised? No, no. Okay. Uh, I'm quite happy to second that. Um, so any, any matters for discussion members? No, so let's go with the recommendation at item three and four uh, on page 153 um, that the licensing committee adopts schedule four of the local government act for the whole of South Cambridgeshire district and designate all roads and streets within the district as consent streets with the exception of the A11 and the A14 to take effect from the 1st of March 2022 uh, and that this, this then goes on to explain that it was advertised and no representations were received. Um, and that the licensing committee agreed that the draft street trading policy be circulated for public consultation with this committee approving the final policy after the consultation exercise. So, uh, Councillor MacDonald, do you want to speak? Um, yes, Chair, I think you answered my question. Um, so we're, out, we're going out to consultation. This is scheduled from 1st of March next year. Yep. So it will come back to us. Yes, it will. Yep. Yes. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, does everybody agree with that? Do you want to show by affirmation? Good, okay, so that's agreed. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, um, with that, I think uh, we've got no further items to consider. So thank you very much. At 15.47, just before four o'clock, we'll close the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you.